in, I, in discussing archaeology of the digital, uh, uh, Greg makes the point that uh, digital culture uh, in architecture is no longer simply about the future, uh, but has a past to be excavated. Uh, and that he also points out that that past um, being excavated is not a black box. Um, so I think that um, what I'd like to extend this black unboxing, if you will, uh, to the study of architectural research programs affiliated with Digital, digital technology in the context of Columbia and MIT. Um, my talk is structured in three parts. In the first part, I'm going to discuss relevant differences between uh, architectural and digital cultures at Columbia and MIT in the 1990s. Uh, the second part, I'm going to talk uh, to research programs in the Emergent Design Group that I directed at MIT uh, from 97 to 2002. Uh, and hopefully that will not get too technical or nerdy, but I'll try to make that accessible. Uh, and in the third part, I'd like to briefly discuss how I believe this research influenced digital design and ways it continues to be carried forward, at least in my uh, architectural production and research and teaching. So, um, The, uh, I was at Columbia on the design faculty from 91 to 96 and participated in Bernard's uh, early period of Bernard's tenure as dean. So the other, the other speakers in this series, Greg, uh, Hani, Reinhold, and Bernard, especially Greg, Hani, and Bernard, who spearheaded the initiative at Columbia, can speak, I think, much more directly to the paper, the studios. But I will give a little summary of at least a take on it uh, from my perspective. Um, um, so uh, I think it's now self-evident uh, that in the 90s, Columbia was a primary center of design and digital innovation in architecture. Um, and where uh, many of the I think the professional offices at that time were integrating 2D and 3D CAD. The paperless studios effectively invented and developed specific and highly influential, uh, highly influential approach to digital design thinking in architecture. So as always is the case in, in invention, this was an inventive transformation of tools and techniques developed in three or four previous decades uh, in other fields, most specifically uh, mechanical engineering uh, and software development in animation and film. Uh, so, um, and as I recall, the two or three initial paperless studios that were led by uh, Greg and Hani, um, and Greg should correct me if I am wrong about any of this, uh, that they were housed in the rafters um, at Avery Hall and focused on breaking and rethinking conventional design and off-the-shelf software, and that beginning with Soft Image, later Alias Studio, and uh, ultimately mine. And within a year or two, uh, machines and students started to percolate, filter down from that uh, perch into the vertical studios. And by the time I left Columbia in 1996, um, these, were, these new tools and techniques were becoming part of the design culture of the school at large. Uh, this is also a time in which the internet became part of daily life and the distribution of information and tools was also transforming. Um, so, in my experience, the Columbia paperless studios were independent of and somewhat unrelated to other departments and earlier digital culture on the campus at Columbia, um, including computer science. Uh, the initiative may appear ex nihilo, given the speed and seductiveness of the implementation. But in hindsight, uh, I also don't recall an explicit theoretical discourse a priori to the paperless project. And this was, from uh, 
my understanding, a dive into the deep end, a sort of base jump with little or no preparation, direct preparation. Um, and I, I think that's part of its success, is this uh, uh, very direct and immediate encounter with um, these new uh, tools and techniques. So while in these years there was certainly uh, Deleuze, uh, Deleuze's rhizomatic thinking was in the air, um, but there, was, there were no real antecedents also for this experience at Columbia. So um, while one could say that um, this initiative wasn't con connected to digital culture on campus, which may in fact not have really existed, um, the Papler Studios were, as the school as a whole, deeply rooted within New York architectural and intellectual culture, with links and antecedents uh, in a number of fields, including semiotics, deconstruction, and a lineage uh, tied to the Institute of Architecture and Urban Studies. So that's in one direction. In another direction, one can uh, understand Bernard's experiences at the AA in contact with cybernetics and experimental design culture centered around figures like Cedric Price and Gordon Pask. So all this is simply to say that CU's architecture pedigree and that of the paperless studios is in fact very rich, complex, and compelling. And the extraordinary influence of this project can't be separated from its institutional context uh, and uh, the New York uh, scene institutions and of course an extraordinary group of talented and well-informed uh, young designers who were at the core of this initiative. So um, also with hindsight, I think the paperless, uh, the idea of the paperless is a radical challenge to the techniques of representation in architecture um, and igniting a, uh, a debate that continues to animate architectural discourse on what is technology, what, are, what is a tool, and what is a technique. Uh, paperless in this context is far more charged than the more anodyne paperless office. Um, as it speaks to the essential expertise of the architect. This implicit radical transformation of the architect's status also accelerates uh, with the internet by the mid-1990s, breaking down the boundaries of office archives, changing the distribution of information and traffic in images and so on. So this is freighted terminology, I think, the idea of paperless. Um, and it's tied to new interfaces and workflows on the one hand and to new geometries and means of generating form and thinking about fabrication on the other. Uh, uh, reading the New York Times this morning, um, uh, I was, uh, I don't know if anyone saw this, but I was struck by the obituary this morning of Douglas Engelbart, uh, who is credited as the inventor of the mouse. Uh, but whose vision and description of network computing speaks in some ways to the character of the paperless studio. Uh, Engelbart's mouse was only one part of his vision of a networked computer system that he demonstrated in December 1968. Uh, and that included, of course, his famous mouse, but also text editing, video conferencing, hypertext, and windowing. But what struck me uh, was the account of his vision of researchers working in small groups sharing computer power. Uh, he called the approach bootstrapping and believed uh, what he called their, that this would uh, raise what he called their collective IQ. Uh, this is quite simply a description in, of both the original paperless studio and uh, the research project that I'll be discussing at MIT. Um, so while we've assimilated computers with isolation or associate them now with isolation, to some degree self-containment um, and virtuosity, the paper, the studio, at least as I remember, was a form of bootstrapping and as much a conceptual exercise 
as individual virtuosity. Um, so at that stage, outputs uh, were often far less important than the high-level conceptual thinking involved in their making. And I think we need to, uh, in, in our time now, regain this uh, raw intellectual, creative energy and excitement around the digital in the present and through new and equally ambitious initiatives. Um, so where uh, Columbia was part of, um, I'm sorry, here's Douglas Engelbart and his uh, mouse. Um, so while uh, Columbia is part of obviously the New York School and uh, New York's art and cultural institutions, MIT uh, as a research institute, I believe uh, Phyllis is very familiar with MIT having been, I know when I was a student, um, uh, you were on a visiting committee uh, at MIT in the 1980s uh, in the history theory program there. Um, so you're, you are very familiar, I'm sure, with uh, some of the things I'll be describing here. Um, but I don't think that, uh, that these are generally uh, topics that are well understood, um, but are important to framing the work that uh, I'm going to discuss today. So MIT, as a research institute, moves in a, in a very different orbit and is focused uh, around the invention and development of computation and digital technology itself. Uh, MIT also has a rich legacy of innovation in the arts that was led by figures such as MIT President Jerome Weisner, um, who's shown here in this image on the left, with Namjoon Pike, and on the right, uh, Kapish, Gregor Kapish, a Bauhaus artist, and one of the first critics to engage art and technology issues. So where um, architecture at MIT was vital uh, half a century earlier during the 1940s with figures like William Worcester, Alvar Aalto, Buckminster Fuller, Charles Eames, um, significant institutional developments in the, in also included in later decades the Center for Advanced Visual Studies under Kepish in the 1960s who produced a series of really uh, extraordinary books and studies and established, uh, a, 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 I think, a very unique and important way of starting to look at art and technology. Also, um, part of the uh, MIT legacy here is in the Architecture Machine Group under Nicholas Negroponte in the 1970s. Um, and the 1970s was also a period uh, in which the conceptual uh, and programming framework for modern software was invented. So these are, I think, some examples of publications from this period. Uh, on the right is a, uh, an account by the machine, uh, Negro Ponte's machine group on how to begin to conceptually uh, frame the idea of software. Um, also, um, uh, at MIT already in the 1960s, so we're now talking going back something like 40, 50 years, um, that, um, that the digital has, uh, this has a, quite an extensive uh, history, of course, that I think also needs more attention. Um, and uh, we have already in the 60s Ivan Sutherland, um, here at the uh, computer, a uh, mainframe computer, um, with uh, his sketch pad application that in effect effectively invented the graphical user interface and also had the first window drawing program and clipping algorithm which allowed zooming. So um, these innovations in computer graphics as well as the origins of CAD CAM in the 1960s were not limited to MIT, of course, um, with work going on in many other uh, institutions uh, in, in the United States and elsewhere. Um, so um, now MIT architecture 
um, famously and understandably has unique challenges in the face of the MIT's techno science juggernaut. Um, and this identity crisis, if you will, has at times, for an example, the case of Kempish, I believe, been extremely productive with an understanding of architecture as operating in the space between disciplines, uh, but, has, but has become vastly more acute since the 1980s with the emergence of competing design cultures in the media, arts, and sciences at uh, the Media Lab, um, ideas and uh, concepts of design in engineering and computer science. So this um, intellectual and cultural friction offered fertile ground for me um, going to MIT, going back to MIT as I had um, been a graduate student at MIT in the 1980s, mid-1980s, and also had been a faculty member um, towards the end of the 1980s as well. Uh, that this offered an, uh, an, another uh, framework, another platform uh, for approaching the digital um, within architecture. So um, in the early 1990s, soon after Bernard arrived at Columbia, Bill Mitchell was appointed uh, MIT dean uh, with some institutional support to move the school uh, physically and academically back into the larger MIT community. And a key part of this project was um, the design studio of the future. Uh, a digitally uh, focused graduate design studios that uh, I taught and co-taught um, for a number of semesters with Bill uh, Mitchell. Um, and this platform was limited to a single studio uh, with a much small, within a much smaller department than, that, than at Columbia. Um, and uh, Bill's interests uh, were broad and generally open-ended, but he had specific interests in prototyping, incorporating remote co collaboration and early 3D printers into the studios. Um, this model, of course, is now ubiquitous, as students today operate uh, with Skype and DIY printers on their desks. Um, Bill also had a keen interest in telecommunications, and we experimented with remote collaboration and critique with, a right, with partners on and off campus as far afield as London, Lisbon, and Los Angeles. Um, so these studios were also a platform for collaboration with the Media Lab, uh, where Bill was also dean, and with industrial partners, including, for example, a studio carried out with Xerox Park in Palo Alto with uh, John C. Lee Brown, who was then director of Xerox Research. So this was um, a, a very exciting and quite different uh, context from uh, the Columbia uh, uh, Paperless Studios. And uh, I was able to uh, build on those exchanges and collaborations um, in founding a, a research group called the Emergent Design Group that I co-founded with Devin Weiser in 97, shortly after arriving at MIT. Um, so before just going through uh, some of the projects and the research uh, that we uh, did during those years, I'd like to also position this initiative uh, within a set of other institutionally specific research programs. Um, so MIT has had a long transdisciplinary research uh, history of initiatives and collaborations with industrial partners stretching even back into the 50s, uh, 60s, and 70s, um, and was, of course, the institutional base for Norbert Wiener, uh, the originator of cybernetics, uh, but also the original pioneering experience in, experiences in computer design and robotics in the 1960s that I summarized some of those experiences earlier. Um, by the 1970s, um, uh, digital design culture was active um, as, uh, through Negro Ponte and also uh, along with interactive media pioneer uh, Muriel Cooper uh, who went on to form the Media Lab. Um, 
And Negro Ponte um, described the Media Lab as uh, an effort at synthesizing Bell Labs and the Bauhaus. Um, and uh, the Media Lab has arguably been the hub of design thinking, uh, if not architecture on campus, since the mid-1980s. Uh, it certainly became the most culturally significant set of design research programs if Wired, Microsoft Research, Google, and Facebook are representative of design culture today. So for the 1990s, uh, the Media Lab defined the public face of technology, one could say. It, it defined the UX or user interface experience. Um, so, also uh, relevant uh, to uh, the uh, Emergent Design Group was research in um, evolutionary planning, uh, evolutionary programming, sorry, and robotics um, in the artificial intelligence lab that was then at that time directed by Rodney Brooks. Um, Una May O'Reilly, a research scientist in the AI lab, uh, co-founded the Emergent Design Group, which I'll call EDG, um, and brought cutting-edge programming expertise to this group. Um, in the mid-90s, AI was also undergoing a paradigm shift from old AI to new AI, which um, was pioneered by Rodney Brooks, um, from expert systems to distributed and bottom-up models of cognition and environment-based evolutionary models. So these agent-based models were tied to new high-level programming uh, languages and uh, new evolutionary and genetic programming techniques. Uh, other um, influential figures um, at, uh, and precursors for the kind of work that we engaged in, in EDG include Danny Hillis um, and his uh, massively parallel processing connection machine uh, and Cambridge-based Thinking Machines Corporation, of which this is um, uh, one of their uh, machines from the early uh, 90s, late 80s, early 90s. Uh, and uh, another figure that's important um, in this context is also Carl Sims, uh, who used this uh, Danny Hillis's uh, machine. Hillis engaged young programmers um, to develop applications for this new uh, massive uh, the parallel processing machine that could do new kinds of calculations, um, and, uh, but had no software. Um, and uh, Sims used this computer to run a number of influential artificial life programs with a focus on locomotion and movement and evolving behaviors within simulated artificial environments using fitness criteria. So all this points to the fact that in the 1990s, digital culture at MIT um, went far uh, beyond um, off-the-shelf software and or standard hardware. Uh, computing across MIT was operating under the hood and developing what have become influential models of algorithmic design, agent-based and ubiquitous computing. And in the 1990s, uh, computing was becoming the engine of experimentation and research in architecture, uh, engineering, and the sciences and advances in computer technology uh, had made the technique of simulation and iterative pro prototyping as crucial in science, design, and engineering as theory and experiment were in the past. Uh, that's a, actually uh, a paraphrase from John Seeley Brown um, uh, uh, regarding the importance of computing in the sciences and their relationship to theory and experiment. So many of these advances were related to the availability of high performance computing and new software that enable high speed generation of formal systems and structural morphologies as well as new algorithms for searching, matching, aligning and representing information. 
So, um, contemporaneous and uh, related research groups to EDG include John Maeda's Aesthetics and Computation group in the Media Lab with whom we shared a number of students and researchers, and also Shistov Ludichko's interrogative design group in the Department of Architecture and uh, what was left of CAVS at the time, CAVS. Uh, and I was also a member of uh, research groups at the Media Lab and in engineering. So um, it's within this ramified, if you will, intellectual and technological framework that I launched the Emergent Design Group soon after arriving at MIT in 97. Um, and in MIT tradition, this small group uh, bootstrapped itself out of a loft space on Massachusetts Avenue that once housed the Center for Advanced Visual Studies and had incubated the Media Lab in the early 1980s. So EDG was not an effort to reconstruct or simply transfer the Columbia Paperless Studio, but to build a design research platform at the convergence of computation, computational materials, and robotics. Those were the three areas of focus for us. And uh, my primary interest in forming this group was to connect computing with emerging material processes and behaviors at a morphological level. And I, I think what's uh, important um, uh, uh, for us at that time was the value of computing really was as a lingua franca, as a uh, platform that we could use to work with uh, uh, and collaborate with other uh, research groups and uh, across what were previously pretty self-contained and closed um, uh, research cultures. Um, and that this, I think, has further in, uh, intensified with the emergence of visual thinking across the sciences and media, arts, um, that has been facilitated by computation and new techniques of representation. So this allowed us to uh, ha have a common, if you will, a common basis, conceptual, but also practical basis to collaborate um, with research groups across uh, campus and, uh, and in areas that were previously inaccessible to us. Um, so, uh, with institutional support outside the Department of Architecture and Grants, we were able to install a series of silicon graphics machines running alias Wavefront software, very similar to the setup at Columbia. Um, this was also a common platform with a wide range of research groups on campus from biological modeling to aerospace, um, AI, and robotics. So this meant that we were sharing uh, uh, a, a platform uh, that allowed us to speak, at least uh, uh, on a, on a, in, in a way, on, a, on an equal plane. Um, and with partners um, from the AI lab, we created an experimental programming lab on campus that attracted talented young programmers um, who found architecture to be an incredibly interesting and challenging set of problems. Um, MIT uh, research groups generally are not application oriented, they do basic research, um, and so finding an application um, that uh, is challenging to pursue um, in a in, in a new environment and a new set of uh, problems was something that was very attractive to these students. Um, and this also allowed us to establish some uh, studios in which we paired programmers and uh, designers. So we had studios in which we had, for instance, 17 year old uh, computer science students working alongside uh, graduate student design students and uh, who could program and write applications or write uh, routines on the fly in relation to things that the design students wanted to explore. So this was really um, something that could not be done at, at Columbia. 
there wasn't that kind of culture. Um, so this was a different kind of environment and also a different set of possibilities. And so our projects, in, in, in a way, use this to cut across architecture, uh, AI lab, media lab, computer science, material science, and engineering programs. And um, we started to develop a, a very particular uh, approach to building design machines um, that could start to uh, expand quite quickly, expand the formal language of architecture at the time. Um, so this uh, approach also used open source tools and techniques uh, and uh, was intentionally flexible and hybrid, uh, anticipating in a way the phenomenon of scripting. Uh, but the work was also named, aimed at a number of audiences in architecture, but also computer science, and AI, um, and media arts. So that each of these projects had to, uh, our goal was to break new ground, not just in this architecture, but also in those other areas. In other words, to use architecture as a platform that could also make contributions into other disciplines. Um, and this was uh, something that was achieved largely through our work on software. Um, so um, the, the software projects, all the projects that uh, uh, I'll be talking about are all based on developing software applications. It's maybe not the most exciting uh, uh, topic um, and gets a little nerdy. Uh, uh, I'll try to not go, uh, go too far into that. Um, but it is important because um, I think there's a set of concepts here that are nevertheless um, have wider, uh, uh, wider application. Um, so the types of tools that we worked on uh, model the idea of component or object agency and distributed component interactions. So in each case, the types of tools we were working on proposed new control models that are nonlinear, networked, st stochastic, and so on. Um, and they were original in focusing on agency and structure uh, via material systems that articulate, embody, and coordinate, and in some cases, author actions or formal systems. So to demonstrate this, I'm going to uh, provide uh, a high-level view of very, and I'll go quickly through this, um, uh, five research programs uh, and illustrate them with output from the software. So let's remember that this is work also that's now uh, uh, almost 15 years old. Um, so again, I think you'll find this also true with the paperless studios, the output um, is maybe less significant than the concepts um, in our eyes now. Um, and hopefully those concepts are really what we should be focusing on. So the first um, application or an example um, is with, uh, called Germs um, and is a playful example of one of the first EDG projects to explore algorithmic design and evolutionary programming. And uh, this, was, this project was uh, carried out in a graduate studio and the way in which these studios were structured is we would in, uh, develop an application and then use the studios to beta test those applications. Um, and again, those studios had also computer science students in some cases along working along with architecture students. Um, and uh, so in this case, we focus on um, again, integrating uh, ideas of computation, materials, and robotics. And in this case, um, we took on, uh, the, the, as a framework for that, the design and fabrication of free, freeform snor snowboarding courses. Um, and this was, in a way, an early uh, application of real-time material computing, so an experiment in that area. And artificial snow offered uh, a pliable and, uh, and real fake 
uh, material to work with as it can be produced in real time using robotically controlled machines. This was all technology that was already in place available and uh, can also be shaped by robotically uh, programmed snow cats, which was also uh, a technology uh, more or less available. Uh, and terrain can be scanned and modeled into the computer and continuously updated. So we had this very large scale modeling simulation and fabrication environment. Um, and also snowboarding has a, 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 a specific topology, a typology and morphology of surfaces that can be recombined with the user's goal of endless variation and known yet unpredictable sequences. So using uh, bacterial growth as a model, an algorithmic process was designed to generate these courses, varying courses. Um, and the basic uh, topology of courses was established using three classes half pipe mobile S-curve that can be iteratively combined and recombined to a scan topography. So uh, in this sense, germs invokes a traditional approach to generating form, uh, a series of basic elements that are recombined but adds motion-based form and dynamic shaping to that. And in the context of evolutionary programming, this application was interesting in offering a range of courses for evaluation as opposed to optimized routines. So one of the, I think, interesting challenges in, in uh, working with uh, computer science um, and AI is that, of course, their interest is the first question that anyone asks is, how, how is this optimized? Uh, what are your criteria? And uh, the need to be able to have metrics to evaluate results. Um, and, uh, in, and of course, from a designer's perspective, it's not so simple, right? Um, so, uh, but nevertheless, that's a, a challenging discussion um, for design to be in. Um, and also the idea of uh, fitness criteria when our interests really are aesthetic and formal and can't be so easily, uh, uh, let's say, quantified. Um, so that's always a, a, a tension and a struggle uh, in those collaborations. So in this case, the idea of a user interface where users would be able to evaluate through simulations these courses and also interact with them so that this was not a closed um, system. So um, at the end of, uh, of this process, it, it was, we also worked with the uh, uh, resort uh, owners uh, and operators of a snowboarding uh, facility in California. And one of the things that we were really surprised is that one of their main interests um, was the potential to test and verify courses via simulations for risk of collisions and conformity to norms because at this time there was no ability to get insurance um, on these uh, facilities. Um, and they saw in this actually a potential that uh, where paradoxically we were interested in the aleatory. They saw these control, the possibility of control parameters um, and that there was this interesting, as a result of that, this interesting dynamics between chance and control, top down and bottom up. So um, we also in this studio developed a project for a wired half pipe and wearable computing that supported real time data capture, scanning and simulation that would allow riders to review their performance and recombine real time footage within a digital environment. So this is, in a way, an effort to explore the potential in the digital to collapse the physical in real time. And, um, and that experience um, was, I think, important to us uh, in uh, further work. Um, this, this project was also awarded first prize at the Aspen Design Conference that year. 
and recognized as a progenitor for real-time robotic uh, fabrication. Uh, another project that's another, that belongs to another stream of work uh, and EGG uh, focuses on structural morphology and generative engineering uh, tied to advances in material sciences and manufacturing, which is called MOSS uh, uh, for morphogenetic surface structures. Um, and this is a, a software tool that was directed towards generating structural morphology for long-span roof structures, taking advantage of the variability of anisotropic materials and complex doubly curved surfaces. So we're defining a shape and lofting. Normally one would define a shape and loft a surface. Mod Moss would model a conventional, uh, would model a structure through cellular aggregation based on generating a variable three-dimensional cellular matrix. And this tool was written as a plug-in to Alias Studio and was seamlessly integrated into Alias's tool set and uses uh, an implementation of 3D Lindemeyer systems uh, that generate surfaces in a 3D shaping environment. This idea of a shaping environment is something that um, was important uh, also as a, in discussion with work going on in the AI lab, the new AI was environment-based. So the idea of simulating environments was um, an, a, a, a common interest that we shared um, at the time. And in this case, the, the surface is developed in this 3D shaping environment by applying rewrite rules to an axiom uh, with an accompanying interpretation of movement and drawing in space. So in Moss, the designer um, specifies the grammar. Sorry. Uh, specifies the surface grammar, the grammar which could be made up of, say, hexagons or squares um, as a base, uh, and guide surface growth. Uh, by defining shaping forces and boundary conditions. And the interface includes control factors that is establish the grammar, limit generation, and shape that environment. Um, so a significant feature of MOSS is that the environment dictates the final geometry of the surface or structure, and that this environment includes uh, uh, defined user-defined volume or bounding box, to force surface development within its limits as well as different vectors of attraction that draw movement towards some forces and make others repulsive. So attractors and repellers can be parametricized uh, in terms of location and strength and they can be static or mobile um, and used to represent any number of forces within uh, a structure or in an environment. So in MOSS, it's also possible to generate multiple surfaces which mutually influence each other. Um, and uh, one example of a structural system generated within MOSS is uh, this, uh, what we call the freeform honeycomb truss. Um, and in this system, vertices of generated surfaces are joined to form an adaptive 3D cellular structure or membrane that using advanced composite materials, one can start to think about cell geometry, size, wall thickness, and depth can be continuously varied uh, in response to patterns of stress. So as a structure, uh, MOSS is conceived as a network of adjacencies constituted as a result of combinations, interactions, and combinations of forces. Um, and uh, in this uh, way, substance and pattern, so the idea of material and morphology are related, and the project begins to move from atomistic or discrete systems of an assembled uh, architecture to finite deformation mechanics, models tied to non-isotropic materials and non-isotropic fields. So this starts to uh, explore um, the possibility to start to develop tools for generating and fabricating cellular structures 
metabolic surfaces and membranes that allow architecture to gain specific qualities and operate in new circumstances. So this is uh, an uh, animation that shows um, how surfaces are actually generated and the way in which the, the shaping environment is set up. And in, in, in this case, you can see um, two different grammars um, being developed um, in that uh, space. Um, another application that builds on um, this experience and goes much further now in terms of bu building a bridge between local and global simulation of cellular structures is called Generate. Um, and this now uses a, a, another type of uh, technique that's called MAP L systems uh, that ex extend the power of it. L systems beyond branching, as you could see in the moss, there's a branching. Uh, the, the growth is basically operating in a branching uh, from an origin and branching out along uh, several axes. Um, this now allows us to use graphs uh, that are called maps that represent cellular layers um, and um, that has a geometric interpretation that operates first by establishing uh, neighborhood relations between cells and then assigning geometric parameters to a resulting graph and that allows uh, grammar-based rules to specify a model's topology which sequentially defines its geometry so we're now kind of uh, in another phase of being able to have uh, new uh, sets of relations between geometry, topology, and surface grammars. Um, so generates uh, also designed to accommodate iterative control exchange and it supports users introducing new formants and modifying process sequences, including the ability to interrupt, intervene, and then resume an evolutionary programming tool. So this was a, a, an important step and something that hadn't been done before within evolutionary programming that essentially you had to set up uh, a run and then uh, wait, you know, but as in evolution, wait a long time to see its results. Um, in this case, one can stop at any point and, and modify uh, the elements uh, and introduce new elements and restart it at, uh, without uh, losing the original history. Um, so this allows for a much more interactive um, uh, structuring of uh, those, those kinds of tools. Um, so one can start to also see how to um, introduce different parameters that can be used to express multi-level, non-linear, and potentially uh, conflicting design criteria. So uh, similarly, in this case, the weight uh, and parameters of any criterion could also be changed during the run, as I was saying. Um, and one can also affect uh, fitness by changing an individual and inserting those copies into the population. And it's also possible to insert another population into the existing population. So essentially, we're starting to mess with what was previously a very closed um, system that relied on uh, establishing initial conditions and then working uh, off of those initial conditions in a much more, let's say, linear fashion. So. Um, that one of the, I think, interesting characteristics of this tool set is that it also allows for um, grammatical evolution that allows for a whole range of hybrid grammars. So these uh, characteristics are significant in the context, I think, ultimately, of designed anisotropic materials because we have now the potential to instantiate morphological models with the capability to combine materials and the macro behavior of the surface structure as a whole operating within a dynamic shaping environment. So this could potentially lead to different control models for different materials and different grammars for the larger structure 
uh, related to specific material properties. Um, so in this way, tunable properties or factors in the materials could be adapted through mutualist feedback within a, an emergent structural morphology as a whole. So these are the kinds of concerns, the kinds of interests at play. Um, so um, this is one other application that's called agency that was developed in collaboration now with Herman Miller um, in, and um, that uses uh, Herman Miller research um, that uses aliases um, application API um, and that in this case we built a genetic uh, programming, programming system that was operating over a language that expressed three-dimensional designs and free-form deformation of space to generate populations of designs with agent-based evaluation. So agency uh, extends a genetic algorithm paradigm, and this is a, a short animation of a run of, I think, 20, so 20 responses. These all appear simultaneously, um, but are here um, done sequentially. Um, that uh, allows for uh, a user-based or user-programmable agent-based evaluation and analysis of an evolving three-dimensional form. Um, and was also for us a testbed for interactive design based evolutionary computation. So um, I won't go into the, the, all the details of this, but there are a series of operations here uh, that include Boolean operations, the um, translation, and extrusion. So there's a number of operations that can be called up uh, in various process sequences and shuffled and reshuffled, um, and that operate on uh, an initial uh, set of curves. So um, again, I think one of the interesting things in this uh, in, in agency was also the possibility or the potential for a user to interrupt, intervene, and resume the design generation process under changing goal criteria. So um, this also um, led to a, uh, I think, an, uh, uh, an interesting discussion that uh, ultimately that needs to be engaged here is um, the, how do you position these kinds of tools relative to an architectural project or to architectural design? Um, and, uh, Herman Miller was interested in looking at um, techno, uh, large organizations. Um, in this case, we were working with a program provided by Texas Instruments for a research center in um, Silicon Valley um, and used that program as a kind of a test, a proto uh, example of how one could start to understand and track a complex organization that had variable uh, work groups and changing sizes of work groups and how would you start to begin to track and accommodate that um, within uh, an, an, uh, a larger uh, architectural framework. So this is a kind of proto-architecture that was produced um, in that uh, project and I think um, that, um, that, that this idea of one needs to be, I think, very careful with these kinds of tools, that they're not, in my mind, these were never projects. These are not architectural projects. These are oblique to architecture. Um, and that um, can't, outputs are not designs. Um, that these are, in a way, research projects that are exploring different techniques, but are not in and of themselves an architectural project. Um, so, uh, the last example I wanted to show here is called Weaver um, and is the, possibly the simplest but ultimately most robust application that we developed in EDG um, and is inspired by computer controlled weaving and braiding using fiber based composites such as unidirectional carbon fiber, toe and tapes. Um, and this tool was developed 
uh, in relation to, or to support the design process of my firm's carbon tower. Um, and this tool remains in use in, in our office today. Um, and I think that is an interesting, again, an example of how these tools may relate to an, uh, a larger architectural ambition or project. Um, so uh, what I'd like to use as a demonstration of uh, Weaver is actually a project we did in 2005 um, that used Weaver almost exclusively um, and which is uh, uh, an early study here running in this animation um, that um, allowed us to uh, use weavers as a, a grammar capable of describing and generating woven strands uh, to user-defined surfaces. And these resulting weaves, as you can see here, uh, can be complex and depend on both the description of the weave pattern and topology of the user-defined surfaces. Um, so uh, weaver allows the user to specify custom patterns or weaves made up of any number of strands with any cross-section. Um, and instead of surfaces, you get strands, vector bundles and tangled structures. Uh, and the underlying principle of fiber agency and affiliation is, is more informal and three-dimensional than conventional woven patterns would offer. So what we use here is a heuristic based on templating or breeding uh, to generate a range of fiber behaviors that are sequentially combined and recombined to form a basic fiber group that in turn becomes the template for a specific three-dimensional textile. So um, these are, uh, for instance, four studies uh, instantiating specific fiber behaviors that are ultimately combined into a larger structure. And um, fabrication, the idea behind this also is um, thinking about the logistics of uh, fabrication as well, uh, ranges from manual placement to robotic protrusion and spinning from within a hollow interior. So material properties in this case can also vary from organic fibers with increased hy hydroscopic behavior to basalt fibers with very high fire resistance. And in one approach, to fabrication, we imagined a templating process and generative procedure underlying the fiber patterning to parallel the construction of, the, of a tower itself in situ. So the, in, in this project, um, an 18-story prototype is like a giant textile made up of nested, protruded members. Um, and uh, the, the strands build strength through relatively weak elements that are arrayed in uh, massively distributed, spun and tangled networks of fiber whose topological complexity and uh, structural behavior is actually in, intentionally beyond calculation. So in this case, um, the, um, we can see uh, here uh, the earlier images of a a computer model, three-dimensional computer model, and here is a 3D uh, print of the uh, same uh, geometry. Um, and again, this has uh, thousands and thousands of elements um, that have to be tracked, and eat the, uh, ultimately each of these strands is understood as an agent uh, within this system. Um, however, it's actually much, we found ways um, to make this um, uh, viable and much simpler by, um, through uh, iterative studies, we found we were able to generate the types of patterns um, that we wanted um, through only 114 strands. So there's actually a unit that's stacked in this um, that allows us to have a basic uh, unit of 114 strands that are then recursively nested uh, 70 times to yield approximately 80,000 strands that make up this prototype. So 
Um, as you can see here, there's very uh, particular kinds of behaviors that are explored and, and discovered and used, such as uh, fraying, bundling, knitting, bias patterning, and each of these has been, all of those uh, behaviors is templated into the design. So uh, a key, I think a key question this, this project raises is how we might accept and play into construction as an imprecise and materially driven process by using the most advanced technology. So um, to uh, conclude this discussion on EDG, um, I'd like to note that um, this project was original in establishing new programming logics and collaboration across design and computing that is design focused, robust and flexible. And by focusing on basic research and computing, EDG did not fall into the trap of generative design uh, that so often confuses means with ends. Uh, that these tools were always understood as having an oblique relationship with architectural objects. Um, and that in our architectural, let's see, it's now referring to Testa Weiser, um, uh, our architectural projects in general, the trace of the tool is not obvious, but layered with multiple tools and techniques involving translation and transformations that stretch beyond any single strata, tool set, or medium. So this kind of hybrid, uh, non-deterministic approach is not readily understandable to computer science that looks for clean code and optimization, uh, but also parametricists that look to computation as a comprehensive system and output as actual designs. Uh, so formal logic, languages and logics in digital design today um, don't look to me so different from EDG tool sets, um, and um, that uh, this isn't to claim that um, we originated anything um, in that regard, but that while we may be, have been somewhat ahead of the curve, uh, we also, I think through this work, gained a sense that there's certainly, while there's certainly new geometries uh, to be explored, algorithmic and computational design processes and computational geometry tend to have a limited range of formal outcomes. Um, and this was not our belief at the beginning. This had to, this was um, seen endlessly, you know, wide open and full of possibilities. Um, but that um, I, this has led me, at least, to believe that to keep moving design forward, um, our work increasingly since the, the mid-90s has sought to engage material processes that bring the digital and the physical closer together. Um, and uh, this um, actually adds complexity um, and adds new challenges um, and that uh, plays on the uh, tension and friction between matter and geometry. And I think also the idea that everything can be coded um, and a focus on algorithmic design free of aesthetic complexities and material resistances was, is not part of, nor was it ever part of, our architectural research program. Um, that computers are not capable of creativity um, and that we're just as interested in the limits of a tool, software, or machine as its possibilities. So I don't believe not everything can be or need be coded. Uh, not everything can be made by machines. Um, and that machines are prone to error and the capacity to creatively and spontaneously engage error and the aleatory um, is, I think, central to any creative process. So um, unlike the black box where we assume inputs equal outputs, in the real world, there's always translations and transformations across media and representations. Um, so, um, um, I'd like to just point out also that this, this work, um, which I've summarized here, um, 
was also widely published and distributed outside of architecture in peer-reviewed journals in AI, in computer science, engineering, artificial life. Um, so there's, I think, a multi-criteria uh, uh, in evaluating each of these projects and different goals. Um, so, and this work also had, I think, an influence within architecture. Uh, in particular, you have, for instance, the AAs, Emergence and Design Group, um, which is not only a very direct transliteration of our uh, group's name, but literally was launched on our software platform um, with tools like Generate um, that was used by them to launch that program. So, um, um, I'm not sure how much time we have here, um, whether we have time to just uh, make a quick view into the present, or, or if we should wrap this up here. Um, how are we doing for time? We have, I mean, five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. Maximum. Five minutes maximum. Um, uh, well then. But I am very interested in what you have to say. Okay. where I teach, um, ha has focused on expanding and, and preparing this talk, it, it occurred to me I hadn't really thought about all the relationships between the work that we did in the 90s and this project, um, but that um, this is an initiative that um, looks at a new interface for design and looks to robotics as, in a sense, the future, or let's say, present of computing, um, in which we can now start to really challenge and think about the interfaces that we're using in, uh, as we design uh, today, and that also um, starts to really bring into a very direct relationship the physical computing and uh, digital computing. So the ability to move back and forth across a digital physical interface in which what we've done is to start to use Maya now um, as a motion control uh, tool uh, for robotics. Um, and that brings again this digital, the digital the convergence between the digital and the physical into very direct and ultimately interesting and I think quite productive uh, relationships. Um, so since I have to go very fast, um, uh, <laughs> I'll move very fast into this. Okay. Um, so this is here what you can see is kind of the kernel of this project, which is on the laptop in the foreground. Um, you have uh, a Maya uh, window open that is a simulation environment. And in the background you have, we have five robots here. Um, and in the background you have actual physical robots. Um, and the ability to move back and forth between these interfaces to actually, in a sense, also crash through um, the flatness of the computer um, is, I think, a fundamental possibility and, and one that is producing, I think, new, uh, new types of representations and a new way of starting to think about maybe we could argue that this is the beginnings of digital 2.0. Um, and that allows us to um, set up projects. In this case, this lab is much more about representation than it is about fabrication. So um, not to limit uh, robotics to just acting out let's say, the next or inevitable step in digital fabrication, but to use this actually as a design platform. Okay, how's that?
don't you need some kind of meta theory to tell us how to organize the hybridization? Mm -hmm. Since you're playing with a lot of different stuff, you know, bits of codes, bits of you know, inherited culture, etc. Yes. What's the glue? Um, that's that's a, <laughs> a very good question. Um, I don't know. I mean, we're in a time where I don't think we understand all the elements enough to make a meta theory. Um, I do think that um, it's important to be able to evaluate these things, but ultimately I think that's something that requires sensibility. I don't think that's something that we could, um, you know, uh, dictate or, or uh, easily summarize into a tool kit or into a set of instructions. Um, I think that it's more uh, also the way in which you develop your signature today is going to be the way in which you combine tools, the way in which you create these process sequences and know when to use what and how and with what force. Um, so I think that's more a question of signature um, than it is, uh, you know, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a meta theory. constitutes an architectural project has to be a reflection on uh, the conventions of architecture and the discipline of architecture and I don't think that's something that can be uh, simply summarized in a, in a tool um, or in a set of routines. Um, so um, what constitutes an architectural project is going to involve many layers um, and also um, is going to involve the culture of architecture uh, and not just computing. I mean, one of the things this morning that I found so interesting is that unlike a lot of architects that approach technology and complexity and accept, let's say, a structural or technological paradigm, it seems like at various points you're trying to invent a new structural and technological paradigm. And I think with the Braid Tower especially, mm -hmm. and I was very interested when you talked about the black architecture of these, the relationship of extruded steel to center line geometry. And I think to some degree, how much do you think a new paradigm comes out of some of these tools? And to what degree are they used to just reorganize the old paradigm? Um, yeah, I think that's the <laughs> that's a, uh, a a very tricky question. Also, um, is to what degree does the digital change the way in which we actually conceptualize and think about architecture, um, as opposed to simply produce something that um, we were already thinking about? Um, and I think that's an open question that um, needs to be, I think, pursued over the course of these seminars. Uh, in uh, I'm in my own experience, I'm maybe too close to that to be able to really distinguish. Um, uh, I have a classical training as an architect, um, so for me, I can't really separate that um, the culture of architecture from these new tools um, and their influence. Um, and I think the answer to that is that you need to make your own tools, or at least be involved in the making of those tools. Um, and that they also, uh, I think in the case of the example with Mies, um, is the understanding of material um, at a really fundamental level, 
even if those materials now are fully synthetic, um, is a way of beginning to, I think, um, engage um, the, the to, to bring these things so close together that I can't be separated anymore. So for me, I also, I think this idea of the digital and the physical, I think that's, we've passed that. Um, I don't think those distinctions are really that productive anymore. I don't know if I'm answering your question, but. Um. No, I, I mean, I just think there was a lot of discussion about needing new materials because we had new tools. Yes. I think that there's also an extreme, say, when we're talking about Foster mm -hmm. or maybe even Zaha, where conventional construction is put to new levels of complexity just with digital tools. You don't need to invent anything. Yeah. You can do it all with steel and concrete. Mm -hmm. It seems like you're erring more on the side of not looking for some 3D printer to make a funny shape, but looking at the properties of fiber materials and scaling them up to towers. Yes. I think that's a, a long-standing uh, architectural tradition, though. I mean, I think that's the way innovation in architecture has always happened, um, is the introduction of new materials uh, and new techniques of representation are the things that drive architecture forward. So I think that, in, at least in my perspective, we're continuing that tradition. Um, and uh, what I can't distinguish is to what degree is this really uh, moving in a new direction. Um, and I think you, you were very unique in that proposal. I think if you talk to a lot of other people, they'll say one or the other yeah. happens, but not two at the same time. I like the two at the same time. <laughs> They're not, um, but I think that that comes from having, uh, I think the designer being able, again, coming back to the earlier point, of being able to make distinctions and to make choices, inform choices, um, and to understand the limits and ranges of different ideas and techniques. Um, yeah, I, I'm just wondering, I mean, none in the sense of the tool actually passing judgment yeah. outcome, but somehow informing your possibility of uh, passing judgment yourself in your the design and because it has built into a certain, um, a certain history or like certain but that may also be part of the, I think, fantastic thing about the digital tools is that, in a way, they open us up. I mean, that's part of our interest is to be challenged um, and to not um, look at them as having, I mean, that's one of the things, for instance, the difference between, say, some early on, the difference, for me anyway, between something like ARCHICAD and AutoCAD, right? That ARCHICAD has an inbuilt proclivity to make walls, right? It wants to make walls. It just keeps wanting to make walls. Um, and um, AutoCAD 
had was the dumbest software in the world, and so you know, in a way, just lame. And um, but it was used to make rockets and missiles and things, right? Because it had no preset application. So I think that um, the beauty is in the idea that it's opening things up to us and challenging us, and even the idea also of the immaterial in the software, I think, is also very important. Um, and this is, I think, where also in, the, in these later, in this kind of next stage, I think we are able to actually appreciate that in a way, again, the anti, the non, you know, against gravity. Right, that the computer brings to us. Um, that on the one hand we can so readily critique, um, but in part that's also an opening, an incredible liberation for us. Um, that we would like to be able to get into, you know, to, uh, another space, right, um, and get off the planet, if you will, or at least get off that mode of thinking about uh, the planet. Um, so. Um, in, for instance, when you're dealing with, you know, six-axis robots and multiple robots and some upside down, some on a wall and so on, we're able to start to really appreciate, in fact, some of those um, seemingly, let's say, um, illogical um, ideas that are in, built into the digital or that seem to defy, you know, our um, let's say, presuppositions about what uh, a tool should be based on. So I, I, I like, uh, to not neutral, but I like to not try to overcode it either. So I like ARC, uh, I like AutoCAD, not ARCAD. <laughs> and that also even goes back into, and I mean, uh, into not having an interface too. And I think that's where building an interface here is really exciting because what that does is it forces us to really go to fundamentals and to really think about what we are trying to represent, how we are representing things, um, and what choices are being made, what's, what's being seen and what isn't seen. Um, though all those kinds of questions are really interesting. What are the problems that you're dealing with in this setup? Um, what were what um, this is now two years old um, so during the first two years we really focused on building this in an interface that allows um, students who are already very adept at a certain software in this case uh, um, Maya that their uh, Cyarch is it, it's an interesting uh, discussion also relative to the paperless studio because Cyarch in a way is the uh, let's say probably the the most uh, influenced by the Columbia experience of, of any school. I don't know if, uh, if Greg would agree with that, but um, I think it's very clearly a continuation and uh, of that experience. So, um, what um, using that interface, you're building an interface between, let's say, what students are already working with and then pushing that interface further into robotics is what we've been doing for this past two years. But what, the way we've done that, again, is to run a series of projects and experiments that challenge um, the ways in which we might work with, the, with robots and representations. So um, this is also, uh, maybe I can uh, take advantage of this to just run through. Here's, again, a project that's starting to build an interface um, on a, um, using, uh, in this case, three robots and spline curves um, on a fabric surface. And so you can see here the students uh, working off of a digital interface, a computer interface, that's um, also taking advantage of the capacity to do things that we can't actually do in the physical space, so it's a combination. So for instance, they're mirroring this uh, form, um, which is something they couldn't, uh, sort of making something much bigger, bigger than it actually is, um, but taking advantage of being able to go back and forth between a physical simulation and a digital simulation. So that's really the kinds of things that we're doing here. Um, so I, um, in some ways, these are 
also um, imaging machines is what I start, uh, I understand this more and more as a kind of, in a way, uh, an expansion on earlier um, drawing machines and imaging machines in architecture as uh, exploring representation is really what I think we're doing. Uh, I have a question about the interface. Uh, yeah. And uh, I was wondering whether the aesthetics of the um, tools that you've shown so far relate to uh, this um, interdisciplinary, oh, this interdisciplinary search for uh, oblique projects and tools, yes. or whether it relates as well with uh, the kind of the limitations of the of the point and click uh, interface, because even in the, uh, in the yeah. In the, uh, in the video that you show now, uh, the student is using a mouse and a, and a screen. And so I wonder if you can predict a little bit uh, um, what would be the what could be the future when once the mouse is gone and yeah. once computers are everywhere. Um, well, we have done experiments here using gestural interface, um, but there. For me, they're too imprecise um, that they actually don't, uh, that, and they also are too, uh, I think, um, based on the body um, and don't take advantage of the abstraction that's possible in this, in the, in the, the current interface. Um, so yes, there are other options for interfaces, but I actually see this whole thing as an interface. So the mouse may still be, is part of that. But we're not just limited to that. So, you know, when I look at a simulation on the, on that laptop, there's nothing behind it, right? Like I go around and there's nothing back there. It's totally, you know, it's purely flat. It's an illusion. So that person working on that interface, there's actually something behind it, right? It's there. They're working in a in a physical space. So I I think that's a very different experience um, and. Um, so mouse may still, and you know, since uh, Doug Engelbart died, um, we should honor his mouse as being something really significant, um, and still has utility. So you know, it's not that everything has to change, right? It's not that all tools have to be superseded. It's how, again, how we put them together. Um, so, um, but I think the ult ultimately, it's to start to rethink the interface um, on several levels. And I, one thing that comes out of this experience is that using small robots, which is what we've done here, has allowed students also to get very close. Um, so you can see um, uh, some examples where students are very much involved in that space. And having spent time in that space, they, they come out with a different spatial understanding, actually. Um, that it's it's really changing the way those students start to think about space, um, which is a topic that's also been kind of off the table because we didn't really know how to deal with it. Um, and I think this this being inside this kind of motion-based space and interface really starts to uh, rethink and and provide us with begin to provide us with maybe some new ways of talking about space um, and conceptualizing. So that's part of the interface as well. One thing that's a very fundamental value, I guess, which I never realized about you, but it's true that the MIT culture compared to the Columbia culture, I'd say, was more about ex expressing ideas through the construction of a tool, mm -hmm. which would not be specified necessarily by the person making the tool. Mm -hmm. versus using a piece of software to make a form, or to, mm -hmm. you know, to make something which was in and of itself the concluding project. And it seems like for you, very much in that spirit of making a tool kit, yes. it, it's more about making the thing, and if you don't know what every one of your 80,000 fibers is doing, that's not a problem for you, because you made a tool that weighs the 80,000 fibers, so the judgment isn't really so much about you placing every fiber. Yes. Place, which is really the paper with studio ethic is how yes. do I place it? How do I place 80,000 fibers? Yeah. And you're wanting to make a tool that's going yes. to place it for you. Yeah. Uh, 
I mean, I think it's just a basic difference in design culture. Yes. Um, and I'm not necessarily sure who else do you think comes out of that tool making rather than form making trajectory of this, of this period, let's say. I mean, do you think about other people in that milieu? Um, in, ar in architecture, uh, not so much because I don't think that, um, uh, unfortunately, MIT didn't um, support in archi MIT architecture um, what has constantly resisted engaging these tools. Um, so in a way, it's an incredibly lost opportunity. Um, so it's, it's scandalous to me still today. It's kind of a terrible uh, story um, that they lost, that we lost. You know, I, as a culture, we lost an opportunity there. Um, but it'll happen. I mean, it's happening. But during a period, it was, in a way, kind of a, a lost opportunity. So I don't think too, there are too many people who had the opportunity to be in that kind of an environment um, in, uh, in the architectural community. It was funny is last week I gave this talk at Columbia, yeah. which was a little bit poking at some of the uh -huh. history a guy, um, Fernando Romero, stood yes. up and said, you know, I work with Gary Technologies, and what people don't understand is that was Bill Mitchell's project, and Bill Mitchell was the one that put Frank on the computer, and he said, those tool sets now, you see it, and he listed a bunch of projects, Asymptote, and he, mm -hmm. he said, you know, the toolkit that was invented out of Bill Mitchell with Frank mm -hmm. setting up GT, now is in everybody's work, and he said, "Well, you know that you should. Everybody should acknowledge that the aesthetics mm -hmm. of GT had infiltrated all these uh -huh. projects, and and the audience was very. Uh, they saw that as a negative critique of the other people, uh -huh. and I was trying to say, why is that a positive thing that the tools are doing some of the design? But they all saw it as well. It was a deficiency uh -huh. in Taha that she didn't figure out how to create or something. <laughs> anyway, but it does, I mean, Frank's computer services company comes straight out of the picture. Yes. So. Yeah. No, I think that is a, actually a really important example. Yes. Yeah. And broad, broad Brooks. Yes. Yes. Yeah, Brooks, I think, is also in, in that picture, too. Yep. Yeah. But in the Arab office and Foster's geometry research group and stuff, there was never contact that you knew of? Um, no. No, we didn't have. I think that in a way we kind of, this is a little pre, uh, precursor to that, to those groups. So some students from EDG ended up in those groups. Uh, but uh, at the time we were, uh, we didn't have that much correspondence outside of MIT yeah. and conferences and so on that we would go to or present this work at um, the, was very difficult to get it over to an architecture audience in those days. Um, it was much easier to go to you know, one of these <laughs> geeky um, computer science conferences where people were very, very interested in the software tweaking and the kinds of concepts that were being engaged. Um, the Santa Fe Institute. It's, what's also nice is yes. there's no discourse of ideal form and this is making nature and all that, yes. which is the problem with that. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, there's some real problem, like artificial life. I have a real problem with artificial life. Um, but um, yes, those were, and that's, you know, the 90s um, was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, Carl Sims and all Carl Sims, that. yeah. He was, um, he was a, uh, one of the originators of artificial life, and he also had these art installations where people would stand in front of something and do, make a funny movement, and it would start to grow differently. So we never used the language. Like, for instance, grow is a term I, I really uh, resist um, in relation to generating. Uh, form, um, which is, 
I think, symptomatic of that kind of period, that the, the, the Santa Fe and also the idea of artificial uh, life, you know. Well, it was interesting at the same time that this was happening. The Indian poet Mahatma Gandhi was writing about the whole issue of Prabhupada. Yes. Uh, was happening. We were part of and then the So many Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think cataloging and uh, creating various kinds of organizing information. Uh, and ways in which you can access and retrieve that information is, I think, very much part of this, yes. And I think that kind of goes into the logistical dimension, too, and I think that goes to Gary uh, Technologies, is also very much involved in ways in which you can align and coordinate information. Um, so that's a very important, I think, dimension to, to this kind of work as it moves into architecture and gives I think a way ultimately of rethinking uh, construction as well, which is I think something that's on the table now uh, and very, I think, imminent um, that Gary Technologies has led the way in. Um, and, um, you know, every time I think this exhibit here is it's amazing to go and uh, this is a, a truly fascinating exhibit. And I think, for instance, the Gary Project in there is also really amazing in terms of the number of different kinds of representations that are in that project. It's really stunning. Can you think you can, can you be a little bit about the thinking Yeah, um, that's something I think about. Um, and uh, is that um, I think that the Carbon Tower project that um, we did is um, quite focused on that or at least engages that. Um, and I think this comes back maybe to uh, thinking about craft and construction in America. Um, and, uh, you know, it comes back to what we were talking earlier today uh, uh, about also, uh, for instance, Mies van der Rohe, uh, the capacity to really get inside of um, the, uh, let's say, the material, um, formation at a fundamental level and to really think about the way in which elements are being fabricated um, end to end, you know, completely at a, a, a across the board. Um, but I think that new, for instance, composite materials in my mind um, for the past 10 years have been a reference um, that allows us to hopefully attain or regain some of that level of quality um, and intensity to architecture, which I think we've lost on the material level. The question I had in mind behind that was because I was really smart by one of the software you presented, the one you can generate structure, yes. which is in a way to do non-structure, yes. the traditional way. Yes. And I had the impression in some ways that you're trying to replace structure or by trying to it by something that has more to do with modularity you know, weaving modular parts or fibers or whatever, but avoiding some a kind of over deterministic structural approach. Yes. And would that be correct? Yeah, I think that that is definitely an interest um, uh, of trying to get beyond the worst case scenario model of structure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, hopefully to move to the best case or better or at least a better case um, and uh, I think that's very important for us in, in this time and with these capacities to really take that on. Uh, uh, yeah, it goes back to some kind of conversation. Uh, I was just recalling the, the idea of the, the two ethics, one is where someone designs 80,000 strands and, and the other where, you know, they, they don't care what the 80,000 strands are doing. Uh, I wonder, uh, in addition to, to different design ethics, if there's an epistemological crisis kind of going on between these two reads where what you're doing, if you're reading, if, if your work is oblique to architecture, I mean, that is the, 
is a space of the um, the aleatory. Uh, does it have an epistemological grounds in a way, in a way that, that the architectonic can? Yeah, well, I, I, I would like to just say, say my work isn't oblique to architecture. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> um, the, that, those research projects, or let's say something that's focused on a very particular uh, set of techniques, <laughs> I was oblique to architecture. But my work is at the heart of it. I want to go to the core of architecture, so I don't see my work as oblique to architecture. I was trying to make a distinction between the ways in which we could develop these kinds of tools and techniques and the way in which we might, where we might situate them. I think that is, in a way, the epistemological position that I'm describing, is, is more um, to understand, let's say, multiple ontologies and the ability to make distinctions and to situate things um, in a more let's say, not black and white in terms of saying this is architecture, this isn't architecture, um, but rather to understand that it's made up of all of these different strands of uh, research, investigation, experience, tradition, and so on. But it seems like um, it will, if, if your work is building upon these things that are really architecture, I mean, that in a sense, they're, they're is it different? archonic ground, you would say, to, to what you're doing than, than what is properly construed as architecture? Well, I think we do a lot of different things. I mean, yeah. we need to do a lot of different things and have lots of different experiences. And also, you want to, you know, expand your your vocabulary, right? Well, yeah, that's right. So, I'm not trying to say this is architecture, this is not architecture. I'm, I'm trying to say, are you estranging the, the condition that can be construed as architecture? Well, it's, I mean, it, there's a there's a law in aerospace. I forget the guy's name. It's named after, but it's that in 25 years there will be one fighter jet. You know, they look at what the military used to have to build, say during World War II, what the Germans were building, however many thousand planes a day. Now there's the Joint Strike Fighter or whatever of which the Saudi military, I think, needs like eight uh -huh. to dominate the Middle East. And the United States now is saying that they'll have, I think, you know, just a few dozen fighter planes in 25 years, mm -hmm. plus all the drones and all that stuff. But, you know, in the end, it might be that architecture is just your test of with robots. <laughs> I mean, because if you, if you look at the state of the field and what architecture used to do, they're in, I mean, everybody says architecture confidently. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, the field is depleted. It's like yeah. half the number of architects you normally have. And what architects used to do is now being done by developers mm -hmm. and builders and things mm -hmm. like that that don't need the architects. Yeah. So, I mean, in a certain way, you want to have, if you want to be that last architect in 25 years, you're going to need to be working with someone like this. <laughs> Otherwise, your, your job's already. It's a song we've heard since Petruvius. <laughs> <laughs> Because actually, the average size of architects firms have has increased. Well, it's true. Fewer and fewer. And there are more and more students for architecture schools. Yeah. Actually, the the demography is it's too yeah. strange. What in the yeah. United States? So it might be architecture shrinking, but architects are developing. In the U.S. Oh, All over the world. And actually, the, the average size of architecture firms is increasing. Well, that's because there's fewer small practices. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you look, I mean, the, the SOMs and Gensler's and all those things, I mean, SOMs half of what yes. it was 10 years ago, yeah. and Gensler is 10 times the size yeah. of what it was 10 yeah. years ago. But in terms of billings, down a lot. So, you know, I think, uh, my sense is that it is centralizing in, in, that, in that way around um, a few large players. Yeah. No, but I, and I think just in terms of revenue, it's far, far down from what it was decades ago. Mm -hmm. It's because what we used to do was just been replaced yeah. by other people. I don't know about, I'm just talking in North America. No, I, I, I don't have know that. in China, or maybe yeah. there's lots of architects somewhere other than North America. But, um, speaker, just to go back to the piece of the idea that you could just pay, that's to be interesting. I don't know if you have any fuel, but I imagine yes. 
that tomorrow morning you, if it is possible, to have just a short uh, introduction on the carbon tower. Yes, I, I, because I, think that I have that, that in this uh, talk, but I, did, I thought we well, I think that would be very yeah. important, I think, to clarify. Yes, I'd be glad to do that tomorrow. Message. Otherwise, yeah. we are spending a lot of time on uh, a general discussion, and I think that just presenting that yes. would be very, very useful to clarify this uh, idea that you have in between the development of tools and uh, a architecture project that yes. in mind. Yeah. No, so I have, yeah, absolutely. I had the project lined up here. Um, I just thought that this was an opportunity no, no, to get into the more of the, the 90s um, and these differences and um, and not so much about a specific project, but I'd be very glad to do that tomorrow. Yeah, I, mean, I think that it would be much yeah. helpful to get. Very, I'd be glad to. Uh, yeah. with, uh, and also the, the logistic component. Yes. That you have, that you don't generally speak about uh, that in this kind of architectural things, but the logistic that you yes. that is very, very important. Okay. It's not only form, structure, materials, but a lot of logistics. Yes. I think it's very, very important. Yes. I'll be glad to do that tomorrow. Uh, well, it's, uh, I had a question. I mean, I really appreciate your presentation. Uh, And I wonder if you have a little bit more to say in relation to computing and computation. Because I think in thinking in architecture has been a focus on geometry and probably the last few years in uh, material, the big important material about uh, linear material. And uh, but basically the, the, sh the digital shift has a big body of geometry. And I wonder if you have something to say in relation to how architects communicate the tools and what and how um, that's not something I've um, spent a great deal of time thinking about, so um, I, I don't think that's in my area of expertise uh, per se, but I do think that um, I did show examples, I mean, for instance, Bill Mitchell's interest in that at the beginning, um, and the idea of uh, using media um, as a as a let's say a platform for architecture, um, and I, I think that's that's uh, in a way another topic um, that I uh, haven't been discussing and that, um, that I'm not really particularly versed in, to be honest with you. What do you think of what's going on with? I mean, that's a bad thing with software. I mean, in terms of there used to be so many boutique yeah. packages and you write your own tool and now pretty much you just get an Autodesk suite. Yes. And everything ends up in Revit. Yes, that's also a very big concern. I think, and that may also come to what you were, go back to what you were saying a minute ago about the shrinking pie um, and uh, a tendency, I think, to go towards these homogeneous structures. Um, there isn't a lot of space in those to do this, any of these kinds of, uh, uh, let's say, experiments. They wouldn't have any value uh, in that. Um, so, yeah, I think that that's actually a big concern about the monopoly the, uh, uh, of software. Um, and at the same time, the dominance then of these uh, other, um, you know, things like um, Grasshopper, um, which may be actually a, 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 a bit of a, a reductive, uh, I mean, I find it very useful, and I'm, I always am glad to have people on um, a team that can do that, that, you, that can use some of those tools, but comparatively, you know, compared to this kind of work, um, those are very, uh, pretty lame, um, because they don't allow a deeper, level of work. Um, so in a way we're getting at a reduct you know, things are getting too reductive, I think, on the on the, the on the side of, for instance, the difference between scripting and writing a plugin is very it is fundamentally different at the level of conceptualization. Um, and so I think that we're losing that capacity on the conceptual side. 
uh, and gaining a certain speed and facility. But those are really about um, just in, in a way um, not too different from routines, right? From a, a certain kind of, let's say, um, efficiency. Um, so yeah, I think this is a really a good point and one that um, would merit um, some serious discussions. You know, what's happening to software. Yeah. Uh, hopefully though, you know, we will have another generation coming along of uh, young people who are good programmers. Um, and I think that could change. I mean, these things also, you know, if we have young people, you know, um, who are brought up in, are better educated um, in these areas um, in the United States, um, then we will, I think, also have another pass at that because they may actually reject that kind of reduction um, and want to fool around and get under the hood and come up with some new uh, software tools. Um, so that could be uh, Changed. I, I don't think that's an inevitability. Well, I didn't get the sense of in Autodesk. Yeah. You can't write a plugin. And they're just installing this design suite almost crashes every right. computer. No, this is true. It's so cobbled together. Well, we may have you know, we may have to go back to older you know older softwares, which maybe the CCA is going to start collecting. <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> And that we could access them here, um, and that would maybe become a font of, of another kind of innovation. Um, yeah. But you know, you found in for example, in let's say 50 years ago, the construction of low buildings here. You know, they used standardized pieces. Yes. 14 WF. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas in Europe, does uh, manpower was. Mm -hmm. The materials were cheap. Mm -hmm. In Europe, it was just exactly the same. Right? But it doesn't affect those cultural differences. Will I agree. Yes, I do think that those kinds of differences will continue and that they can produce unexpected anomalies out of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do you think it might be also just in your shift? It's the same making so much now in the full form. Yes. The relation between design and fabrication, so that in some ways, all the value of form is, is at style in the shift. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I think that there is. But I, I, again, I think that these things there are different. You know, we have I don't know how many schools of architecture. We may have less firms, but we still have a lot of schools. Um, so you know that also offers the opportunity for different approaches, and I would like to see more variation, actually, um, rather than these schools becoming more and more alike, um, is that there's, I think, a, a, an opportunity for them to really be quite different. Um, and that would, I, I think, add a lot to the discourse in architecture. Yeah, but when you get those two things like the NARB. Yes. And those, they keep on pushing. Yes, the they keep pushing. Things. Yeah, they keep pushing homogeneity, and that's really a disaster. I wish, you know, we have uh, some representatives from Harvard here. I wish, you know, one of the leading universities, you know, one of the top tier schools would just refuse them. Recuse them. That's a very good idea. And that would put an end to it. Start with Columbia. Start with Columbia, okay. Uh, but I think that's that. Harvard's <laughs> Uh, that because the other other schools, for instance, like Sire, can't do that. They have already a credibility problem. So uh, it would only be, I think, if Yale or, or uh, Harvard just said, oh, no, Bob won't do that. <laughs>